Mailbag show. I just, every once in a while, I just want to yell that. Just mailbag. Welcome to the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Nate Bauer with me, senior editor at Blue White Illustrated. Going to talk about a number of things over the next hour or so. Our Thursday show. A little bit longer conversation. Take your shoes off, grab a drink. We're going to have a conversation. So that's what we're doing here on the BWI Daily Edition. Nate, how you feeling today? I feel great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I I'm I am not a confrontational person. I don't like. Some people love conflict for some reason. I don't understand that. It like mm-hmm. it, I'm I'm a good good times feel good guy. So Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban makes me uncomfortable. I know everyone loves the debate shows and they eat it up like popcorn, but I'm like I yeah. I don't, I'm not a fan of this, but it is interesting. So, and I I know you wanted to talk about it today. Yeah, I, it, it, well, two things. One, yes, the confrontation part of it is uh, like awkward. (laughs) I mean, how can anybody see this and not think, uh, former assistant, right? Jimbo Fisher is a former Nick Saban assistant. Believe so. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Not. He, he, and he he mentioned something to the effect of not ever wanting to go back and work for him or be right. Like so. Yes. Um. But Nick Saban didn't really say anything about Jimbo Fisher, and not yeah. even. Not only did he not say something about Jimbo Fisher, but I, I don't think he was really making any accusations. It it is. Uh, it's just very curious. I mean, the whole thing to me of yeah. Jimbo Fisher protesting the way that he is and the way that he has about the notion that, okay, by the letter of the law, right, in terms of the NCAA and what you are and are not allowed to do in recruiting, maybe what's being accused does violate that to a to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. But we are all kidding ourselves if – we don't acknowledge that NIL is part of every conversation yeah. that's being had in college football recruiting. Yeah. So let's right? take like, a, let's take a step a step back if people are not familiar with what's going on in that particular situation. Uh, so yeah. Nick Saban uh, was on camera and said about Texas A and M last se- la- last year, and I, I think in the class of twenty twenty two. They had yeah. five five star recruits. It was a record for yeah. a class of any kind. And there's been this conversation the whole time of Texas A and M paid those players through NIL to go to Texas A and M. Yeah. Uh and Jimbo Fisher has been flatly denying that for the whole time. I think from right. his in, from his press conference on the signing day in December. But no other coach has directly said that i don't think until nick saban did recently saying texas a&m they were number one we were number two and they paid for their whole class correct Uh, so then jimbo fisher comes back i believe today in a press conference right and what did he have to say about nick saban's comments I mean, just uh, irate, right? I mean, uh, right. this this is this is so unfortunate, or this is embarrassing that uh, you know a head coach, the goat, right, would make accusations. And the way that he framed it was, I mean, just listen. Uh, hopefully, this is coming across, uh, whether you can see me or not. But I'm just filled with glee <laughs> at how this is being framed. Uh, Jimbo Fisher said. Yeah, you're you're making accusations against 17 year old kids and their families. <laughs> how dare you? Like how 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 can you live with yourself to to do this? And it's like no, like that's incredibly disingenuous yes, in terms it is. of a way to frame what Nick Saban said. And then he also and you, you know very obviously this is this is a personal thing at this point. Uh, He also said that Nick Saban has tried to call him. He's not answering the phone. Uh, They're done, right? Like that's what Jimbo Fisher is saying is that their relationship and any contact that they're going to have is is going to be confrontational moving forward, um, so on and so forth. Well, that's fun. Um, But the, the part that you brought up, 
and I think you've mentioned this already, is that Jimbo Fisher's missing a huge opportunity here, first off. And secondly, he's being really sensitive about the issue. He's being super sensitive about this entire thing, which, as you pointed out, is, you know, paying players to yeah. go to your school is still technically illegal. But if you were to just mention, hey, we have this NIL fund or somebody Correct. mentions we have this NIL fund, you can get fifty thousand dollars for co just for coming here. Correct. That's Correct. Le that's legal, bro. It's legal perfectly within perfectly within the rules. And if like the the. The second unspoken thing that nobody is really talking about is every single college football coach right now at every major program wants to have what Jimbo Fisher has. Right. <laughs> they, they are all dying to be able to create. That's That was the purpose of yeah. what Nick Saban was saying. Nick Saban was speaking to an audience of Alabama fans saying, hey, if, if you don't understand what this is and where this is going, look at A&M and the success that they had because that's what they did. Yeah. And it was it, like, he didn't say, oh, they're cheating. He said, hey, this is, this is how it's done. This is yeah. how you have to do it. And he's trying to get Alabama fans to understand that. Like, it, it, it's very curious to me from, uh, you know, we've been talking extensively over the last months, right, about yeah. NIL and Penn State and how Penn State fans have been receptive or not to the idea of NIL. Yep. Well, yep. if Nick Saban is having the same problems, that should that should tell you where this is at, right? Is hey, there 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 are programs, Miami, right? Yep. Tennessee. Who, who just who Tennessee, who yep. have major donors, whether it's one a handful or many who are gung ho about this. Yep. They are determined. I'd they say USC too. It's not USC. talked about with USC because it's Lincoln Riley. He's now in LA and look at what he can do when he's not in Norman, Oklahoma. It's like, yeah, he's also doing the exact same thing. Let's not pretend like this is the magic of Lincoln Riley. That place it, has had it, that opportunity for a long time. Going, I mean, it's obvious, like Reggie Bush right there. There's the answer of, like, it's been a, a thing for them for a while. And, you know, it's just legal yep. now. But now it's now it's totally above board. It is yeah. within the rules. And so what something that James Franklin has been saying, and I think th this message has been echoed through Penn State for a while now, is, look, <laughs> he might not like this. There are a ton of, I, I would suspect... Nick Saban doesn't like it, right? Yeah. Like this new era is there is a resistance. They don't want to be a part of this. However, if you want to compete in this space, that's what you have to do. And because it is legal, because it is above board, you better be pushing as far up to that line yep. as you possibly can, including rallying the support of your donor base to be not just on board with it, but to be enthusiastic about it, to be determined about it, because that competitive spirit from the donor base is going to have a direct impact on what happens on the field. Like bottom line, until yeah. changes happen, this is the new normal. I, I need to find the uh, the quote here from Jimbo Fisher. Uh, but I, I first off, we're going to get to your mailbag questions uh, today on the show, but this is a pretty interesting topic, and it's one that we've been talking about on the show quite a bit. Um, Jimbo, <laughs> I have him up here on Twitter, but it's like I'm not going to listen to him say it. Um, it's something to the, to the effect of talking about Nick Saban and saying if you have all the built-in advantages, it's easy, right? The GOAT, you yep. have all the, all the baked-in advantages, and then insinuating that Nick Saban was paying for players for years now. I love the idea. This is so perfect. Like I, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go too far here, but it's something very American or very uh, like you are very lost in your own sauce. If you think that Nick Saban having all the advantages and then painting yourself as somebody who doesn't have all the advantages, but also a giant pile of money to go give to 18 year old recruits. Like the fact that you can just give a reported number of money and dollars to a bunch of people to come play football for you. Like, yes, you are the disadvantaged one. That's absolutely true. Everyone should feel sorry for Jimbo Fisher 
and his struggles at Texas A&M with one of the largest donor bases in all of America that just redid a stadium within the last 10 years. Like, yes, we're all crying for you, Jimbo, and your, your struggles against the man with all the problems you've had after leaving Florida, uh, Florida State just like in the middle of the night. Yeah, and left Florida State because they were not all in on yeah. football. Right, like that that major ESPN story that they did about his fallout with Florida State and how he left and why he left was for that reason exactly was because it it is <laughs> it's just it's just so interesting to see these themes overlap and intersect with each other. But the bottom line is, if your entire community, okay, I'm going to include fans in that the university the athletic department, uh, right? Obviously the football program itself. If all of these things are not hitting 110 miles an hour on this, then you're not competing. You're not doing, you're not doing the things that are necessary because that's what these other places are doing, right? Like that's what is happening at other places. I mean, I, I would, I would only say, you know, if there's, if there's a backlash, right? It's, and again, like, I don't want to put words into Nick Saban's mouth because I don't think that this is the truth. He is simply saying, look, this is this is how it has to be done now and you should do it. And what Jimbo's crying about or what Jimbo was saying is you're accusing me of cheating while you've been cheating for all these years, right? Yeah. And the, and the, underlying, this the is... underlying framework of all of this is very much something that was said to me very early in the process, right? By another reporter, not anybody in the business of coaching. <laughs> but I was told one time, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying in college football. <laughs> and so like that, that is it, is how close can you straddle the line or yeah. get cl close to the line of what needs to be done to be able to succeed? And that's just the reality of what the game is today. So I, I do understand, and I'll, I'll come at, this from this perspective because I found another quote like these are gold if you don't yeah. I, if I don't cheat and I don't lie if you if if you did my old man slapped me gosh his verbiage is terrible here if you did my old man slapped me across the head maybe yeah. someone should have slapped him I think at this point we can call that elderly abuse now with Nick Saban at his event he's in the 70s now uh, but 70. anyway I understand a guy who has been all of these people, you talked about the resistance to this change. All of these coaches have operated in one way their entire life. When we talk about, like, they're in the system. They are a part of the system that has worked out. Where, just as an example, James Franklin was a, was a player in college football. He became a coach. He rose up the ranks. He's now at a top 20 university in America as the head coach. So, like, the system worked for these guys. And when you're in that echo chamber for so long, you're in that incubator, it can be very hard to then, Jimbo, hey, no one's calling you a cheater. Right. Nobody's got, but you, the, the insinuation here is that he had to pay players to go to Texas A&M, meaning he can't recruit, and Texas A&M is not a place they'd want to be if it weren't for the money, which all their lives they've been selling the dream of playing college at X university and it changes every four years now. So like, you know, yep. it's hard to let go of certain things. Yeah. No, it, it, it's look, uh, a lot of recruiting already, right. People talk about showing love, right. Mm -hmm. Is about how you are, how as a recruit, how you are perceiving the way that someone wants you, how they value you. Yeah. Okay. That has always been a, about, right. Uh, a, a handwritten letter every day. Okay. Right. Like the, you get from the coaching staff, a handwritten, yep. a, a handwritten letter once a day. Uh, <laughs> they, had, they put the scoreboard <laughs> lights up for you. That is such an you. old ref. I'm sorry. That is such an old reference. <laughs> but that's, but you that's, text that's now. But yeah, That's, no, I know okay. what you're saying. Okay, so it's like a text or conversations or they're yep. hounding you, like whatever it is, all of these different ways to signify that you deeply, deeply want this person to be a part of your 
program. And now it Ma is... Ma Dearest Deshaun, I write to you today. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm derailing no, like, your point, but it, you're making but, the right one. But but now, now there is a dollar figure attached to that. And so, th- like, that is fine. It, yeah. it, it is, right? I mean, yeah. it, it, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you, you know, it crosses over with so many different avenues in, in life, right? Yeah. Like uh, choosing a job, choosing a spouse, cho- like whatever. And different people value different things for sure. But the bottom line is still, you are going to be attracted to something or someone, a program that likes you the most. Yep. And in this day and age, likes you the most more often than not, is going to mean, hey, you are going to find a way to scrounge up the funds to outbid what somebody else is offering. Yeah. I don't know. I don't don't see the problem. Bottom line, I don't understand what Jimbo is so upset about. Like, the way (laughs) that he- This is just like he doesn't like, he just doesn't like Nick Saban at this point, it sounds like, right? I think so. I think, I I mean, like, I get it that there are egos involved for sure. Um, But this, this is a case of like guns blazing over something that I wouldn't even describe as a misunderstanding. Someone could have easily said to him, Hey, Jimbo, this is the context of what was said. This is what was said. Here's who he said it to. And this is what he has been saying for quite some time. Like it's yeah. not new from Nick Saban. Nick Saban's talking about NIL for quite a while now. Yeah, pretty much so anytime I, you hear something from Nick Saban, the quote that makes the news is about NIL. Should we be doing this? But we're doing this. Like we're right. we're doing this. Yep. But should we? And I think yep. maybe that's where some of the subcontext of of saying Jimbo Fisher is doing that, knowing where Nick Saban feels and his his opinion is on things probably informs some of the reaction to this because while you might not take it that way and it may not be totally intended that way probably deep down that's where it came from is that sort of feeling but but jimbo fisher ought to be flattered (laughs) right like (laughs) just bringing more attention to texas a&m and how much they can pay for people yeah, but the way but the way that he's complaining about this it, it makes it come across as being very different from that. Because yeah. if if I mean, this is just me. If, if I'm a Texas A&M recruit today, and hearing that, now I'm wondering, do they not have the resources to do what's been promised to me? Right? Like, right? Do, do, uh, is this is this not going to come to fruition? They're saying that it doesn't happen, but it is happening. So I, I, I don't know. Nick Saban could have chosen more than one school, right? That yeah. he, he could have said Miami, but Miami's not doing it the best right now. Yep. A&M is. Yep. So you always just, point to the best example, just, right? Exactly. So just own it. Yeah. Uh, so we got to get to the mailbag. People have been Let's waiting go. to hear their answers for long enough. And we, we've, yes. uh, I, this is a great conversation, but we've got more good ones in here because you picked them. Not you, Nate. You didn't pick these. Uh, didn't that pick. is not the slide I wanted. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and delete that here in a minute. Uh, BWI Mailbag with me and with Nate. If you want to get your questions in, the best way to do that, Nate, is how? Let the people know. On on the Lion's Den message board is, yes. is the best way. And then the second best way is Twitter. That's correct. But the best the f- way. Yeah. Easiest. Go way. ahead is if you sign up for just $1 for 12 months of access. That means you get, once a week, the mailbag. So I, uh, 52 of them? You could ask 52 questions, right? And maybe we won't be doing this for Christmas or whatever. Anyway, sign up for $1, 12 months of access for a dollar. That's what you get. And you get uh, the, the thread where I put this out, the BWI mailbag question every week, and we'll get to yours here. But I am going to start with one on Twitter because it was a great topic. And uh, our co-worker, Andrew Clay, also follows Penn State on the beat here. Uh, Andrew Clay TV asks, in light of the NCAA, NCAA conference championship changes, should the Big Ten consider changing its policy uh, about the conference championship, realignment, divisions in general? This has been a conversation we've had about the imbalance in the Big Ten for years now. 
Now yeah. you don't have to worry about divisions. Do things change and when, do you think, Nate? Yeah, I I do think that the the movement toward changing from divisions to just the conference, right? So yeah. Uh, 14 teams. I, I think that that is real and has momentum and will happen. Um, it, it'll be interesting to me see, to see who else does that. Right. Obviously the, the, the um, instigation of this f for the NCAA's purposes was, was due to the big 12 mm -hmm. wanting to go to that, to, to, to get rid of its divisions. Um, but now that it's a possibility, now that it's something that you can do and it's formalized, um, you know, it, right. We're always talking about the SEC West, right? Yeah. Uh, the ACC Coastal, or I don't remember the ACC divisions, but it it does feel to me as though just about every conference has a bone to pick within its conference for one side, one division being stronger than the other. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of I, I would almost be surprised. <laughs> or at in this the Big Twelve case, there's only two teams that matter. So and not for long. Yeah. Um, right. So, so yeah, no, I mean, it, it does seem, it does seem like, yes, this is, I mean, obviously now it's, it's formalized. The NCAA has allowed it or permitted it. It would seem to me that the big 10 will follow in, in fairly short order. I don't think obviously not for 2022, but 2023 in play for sure. Uh, this came from an article at on3.com. I think it was Jeremy Crabtree who wrote this. According to David Teal's report, I'm quoting here, the new conference leader revealed that the ACC was moving closer to a 3-5-5 system for their scheduling, eliminating football divisions, 14 current members. The schedule would provide three annual opponents, allowing established rivalries to continue. Ten other opponents split into two groups, which rotate on the schedule every other season. So here's my question. If that is a template for how the yep. Big Ten could operate, do you think that's a good template? We'll start there. Um, do I think that's a good template? Yeah, I mean, maybe. I I don't know. I, I think that variety and randomization probably is the fairest way. You, 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 don't, you don't want to there to be a feeling as though year by year, right? Mm -hmm. That there's a new schedule that comes out that you, that you can't plan for, right? I actually do think that schedules made six and seven years in advance within the conference is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, because, because at that point, like, you know, whatever, let's say you open the season at Nebraska. Well, Nebraska stinks right now, but in seven years, you, if that's been on the schedule for seven years, you know, that that has no bearing, right? Yeah. Like nobody, nobody put that up against you. So no, I mean, I, 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 yes, obviously there are games within the league that need to be preserved. You want to, to have preserved. Uh, Penn State, Ohio State. You want that to happen every single year. Mm -hmm. Frankly, you probably want Penn State, Michigan to happen every single year. So that um, here's here's my next question: Is what then if Penn what would Penn State's three reserved games be, and would they be the same as Ohio State and Michigan? Because that's not to get back into the yeah. are they rivals thing, but they do. Let's look at this from a TV perspective. They do produce the best results on television. So. Yep. Is that factored into that? Uh, you know, it, is Penn State in that cluster? And does that even change then Penn State's outlook? Other than if they win, if they split those games, now they have the opportunity for a rematch where before they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, yes, I think that those are good games to keep. Um, you know, but the third one gives me pause. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't really know what's as obvious. I mean, I think that Penn State and Iowa traditionally have had a good thing. Yeah. Right? Like, it's it's kind of been back and forth. They're I was kind of disappointed they weren't on the schedule this season because you're right. As far as delivering entertaining games, that happens every single season between Penn State like and it. Iowa. Even when one blows the other out, that's an unexpected outcome. Yep. Yep. So, no, I mean, I, it, uh, is it... One of the east uh, eastern coast teams, right? So Maryland or, or Rutgers. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know where the juice is um, yeah. in terms of things that sell. But yeah, it, 
certainly Michigan, certainly Ohio State make a lot of sense for Penn State. Uh, yeah, it only seems to make sense for the teams it makes sense for, right? So right. there are traditional rivalries in conferences, but some teams don't have those. So are you baking in an advantage for teams that don't have a rivalry with some of the best programs in America? Like, is this oh. is this an advantage for Northwestern, who doesn't really have a rival that I know of? I don't follow the Illinois. The sh- Illinois is the rival. For, oh, for darn. Ugh, right. So bad for them. Look at that. Right. You know, like a mid-tier right. program that has the opportunity uh, to to not play those guys every year, not play any of those blue blood programs. Maybe that creates more parity. You'll see more interesting things. Maybe that'll happen. But oh, who wants that? I, I mean, I do. I, I love parity. That's that would be great. I, I just you know, if you're if you're Penn State, even if those are your options for the two right or two of three. Well, first of all. I have no idea, obviously, if the Big Ten is going to go in that direction or follow that type of an outline. But if it if it was three, you could make a fairly convincing argument that Penn State wouldn't want to protect any of those games, <laughs> right? Like, uh, yes, the 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 interest for Ohio State always is, you know, it, it always seems to be one of the top ten viewed games nationally every year. Um, but if you, if you know that that's on the schedule, you know, that you have to go through that to give yourself an opportunity, uh, to, to get to the big 10 championship game, you know, that's doesn't really change uh, anything from the current situation. Correct. Yeah, correct. No, but, but the, the difference is let's say you lose to Ohio state or beat Ohio state, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but you lose to Ohio state and win all your other games this doesn't preclude you from still being able to get to the championship game because yeah. in that format, it would simply be the two best teams at the end yeah. of the season. As, so, you know, you mentioned Iowa, Michigan state obviously was a thing at one point over the last couple of years. Uh, and, and maybe will be with Mel Tucker. Yeah. Yeah. I could make the argument that you don't change anything about the big 10 and how they play games other than it's just the best two teams going to the conference championship because none like you've established these rivalries like if you want to say how do you build a rival because the the big 10 was really trying to take their action figures and and smoosh them together and like you guys are gonna fight now when they were talking about Rutgers and Maryland being Penn State's rivals it's like it takes time and stakes You've created that. So are you going to blow that up? Because that's the TV show everyone's been watching for the last six years, seven years, eight years. I I don't know from a TV perspective that you're going to change any of those things. Because if you're Penn State, then you're like, yeah, absolutely. Maryland and Rutgers are our rivals. Protect those games so we play them every year. And then every once in a while, maybe we'll get one of the the other ones. Uh, We should move on to a different question, though, because we got some stuff to get through. Okay. Losi's mustache asks, sorry for the long winded setup. That's all right. We took 30 minutes to get to your question. <laughs> Ryan put in a prediction for King Mac. He is a safety from Florida. He said he could see that uh, Mac plus one more safety. There's some other players on the board for Penn State. He also said that uh, he'd have a hard time reading the cornerback board, which he's put his cornerback board out since then, by the way. So check that out, bluewhiteillustrated.com. A really great reason. I mean, a cornerstone reason you pay a dollar to get 12 months of that information. Uh, most of the quarterbacks to watch are national guys. So, T. Frank, he asks, as you mentioned in your film room, shameless plug for you, man, he's hitting all the high notes on this setup. Could you see Hussey being Conrad Hussey, a commit for Penn State, uh, and the teammate of King Mac being more of a slot corner than a safety? Do you think the staff could target Mac plus two more safeties, have move Hussey to nickel corner, and then you don't have to take another true corner if you if there isn't one that's worth taking, I, I think this is a realistic scenario what he's painting out, and and there's a lot of stuff there, and I probably should have just read the question through and then explained it. But so Conrad Hussey is teammates with King Mac at St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, my evaluation of Hussey was that uh, he has the physical skills of a cornerback. I, I could see him being a boundary corner, not just a nickel, uh, depending on how fast he is. Now King Mac. He's 5'10", 175 pounds right now. But the way he plays, he plays bigger than Hussey. He hits, he takes players on, he screams downhill. He could be a guy that plays in Manny Diaz's defense as that striker position. So he could be a safety, 
He could be the striker. He could be a slot corner. You know, I think both of these guys provide you the flexibility to play them at several of the positions in uh, in Manny Diaz's defense. So that would be what I would say is, yes, you can take more safeties because these two provide you the flexibility to bring more people into the club at that position. Cool. <laughs> I didn't know if you had a follow-up. <laughs> no, I mean... I, I, I do not, uh, obviously, n n not to what y you do in terms of distinguishing uh, differences in terms of strengths and weaknesses of safeties versus corners. That hip turn is all you, buddy. I'm going yeah. to let you I'm gonna let you tackle that. So that, that is the one area with Hussey that you just don't know. He looks great on film. So he, he moves everywhere really well, but he doesn't play in man coverage. So he's got to be able to play in man coverage. That's going to be a key. Not knowing that, you don't want to say absolutely a boundary corner. But he could play... He could play the field safe. Uh, he could play the field safety. I, I think he could play nickel corner. I think b both of them could play nickel corner, and that's to me an interesting question about this upcoming season. And I'm going to spin this off into a different topic because where does Daquan Hardy fit into the secondary? Is he going to see less playing time because Penn State is playing a different defense now, and Jonathan Sutherland and the way he plays as a former safety? The goal eventually for this defense, I think, is that you never go out of this defense. There, there are no sub packages. Maybe right. you bring on a dime line back, a dime safety to play on third down, and they're going to do that anyway. But really, the whole point is that your base defense is nickel. Like you've got a safety corner linebacker hybrid that can do a little bit of everything. Yep. So, are they going to? Yeah, are they going to bring in another guy that's purely a corner to play in the slot? And does Daquan Hardy see, because he talked about it with us, right, of wanting to do more, wanting to play more. And I think the part yeah. of it is, like, he doesn't see a role expanding for him this year. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, certainly what Manny Diaz wants to do, um, that's, uh, like, we're going to find out, right? I mean, yeah. it's it, it's yeah. too it's too limited of a window to, to really have a grasp on that, uh, I would say, right now in May. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly Terry Smith values Daquan Hardy, like yep. very, yep. very highly, um, and considers him one of the best cover corners on the team. So does that mean that the only place for him, right? Like if, if they don't put the nickel corner onto the field, does that mean that he gets put out wide? Like, can, can he yeah. do that? Uh, do you have an answer for that? <laughs> like, I got because I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the answer is there. I mean, obviously he's yeah. got these size limitations. I mean, I think he's like five. He's five nine. nine. Yeah, there are yeah. there are plenty of examples that I don't feel like I'm cherry picking to say that five nine corners can play on the boundary. But it comes back to the same thing: is does he play small? You know, and yeah. and I don't think he plays small. I think he gives the the effort necessary. He's 180 pounds. He's not he's not the smallest guy I've ever seen play football. Right. But it just it's going to be the question of does he play with the size, physicality and vertical leap to make up for the difference in height where on the outside. And here's the thing, too, is like he was playing Jackson Smith and Jigba at one point in the Ohio State game, who is six one. So the way corners, or the safety uh, receivers, sorry, get to the right position eventually by elimination, the way receivers move around, you can put a receiver anywhere. Mitchell Tinsley right. might play in the slot. You can motion it so that Keandre Lambert Smith is your slot corner, your slot receiver. So you have to play against size no matter where you line up. So it's not a stretch. It just becomes then is he better or is he valuable enough that you're going to take one of the other two off the field in Kalen King or Joey Porter Jr. And then Johnny Dixon works in there too. Like you've got too many good players on the back end at this point. Like they've gotten to a point where they've got so many good cover players. Yep. No, they, I mean they have they have five, and and you know Terry Smith has been pretty adamant through the spring that all will play. So it, I, what you're saying about not having sub packages or or not right, like throwing different defenses onto the field, um, might sound good in theory, but I I don't see where everyone else fits right like you, yeah you just you you it it would seem like you are limiting yourself 
uh, taking away, uh, even if that's the best thing, right? Is everyone yeah. do everything well? That's never reality. Reality right. is always right. that you have specific players who do one thing better than the other. And you, you want to be able to play to those strengths and minimize their weaknesses as much as you possibly can. Yeah. So, so I, I should also preface that that's kind of the final evolution of a defense like this. So right. not to bring this, not to bring up the Homer thing, but that's what, that's the defense. The Buffalo bills run. They run two linebackers and their, their 11th defender is a slot corner. And, and that's how they play. Taron Johnson is their, is their 11th defender. He's a tough sort of corner zone instincts, plays the run well, but covers like primarily he's out there to cover and they want to win with six guys in run defense. That's the idea of this defense. That's right. what, when you're doing that, that's what you're saying. So with that as kind of the template of that, that design of having a safety out there instead of a linebacker, what to me that signifies is we want to prioritize coverage. And when you prioritize coverage, it means you're de-emphasizing the need to switch to bring sub packages on. Now, Manny Diaz used a lot of sub packages the last couple of years. So I'm not saying that that's going to be the case, but it just brings up the question then of what is the final evolution going back to the original question about what are we, what is he looking for in a safety? What is he looking for in Conrad Hussey and King Mack and Cam Selden and uh, the other guys? Is he looking for guys that never come off the field or is he looking for individual things he can play in packages? So that's really why I brought all that up is to kind of look to the future more so than than just with Daquan Hardy as an example. I, I uh, One final interjection that is just so interesting to me is, is Manny Diaz going to be at Penn State in three years right. when these guys play? Right. Who knows? He, he, realistically, like, I, I just, I, I would find it stunning for him to not have another head coaching opportunity uh, between now and then, right? So, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that might be something that you fight for and you want to do it, but, uh, man, just co the coordinator turnover in college football, it's not just at Penn State, it's everywhere. Yeah. Right? Like, nobody keeps their offensive and defensive coordinator because head coaching turnover is so frequent, and yeah. then they right everybody bounces around so it just seems very challenging to me to get that specific about what you right like yeah it, it almost feels like you better have a framework from which there's wiggle room within yeah but like you, you keep those core philosophies or no matter who you replace defensive coordinators or offensive coordinators with yeah you you still want to do these things really really well and then you play around within it yeah so. Well, that's a great segue to Poncho's question. Poncho570 asks, what's the future of the left tackle position like after Olu, meaning Olu Fashanu, the starter as of now? Who's next up and who looks like they can fill that position in the class of 2023? That's two years from now. So Olu Fashanu is going to start his first game yeah. uh, like in 2022. I guess outside of the, the bowl game. His, his first regular season game in 2022. Uh, he is a... Redshirt sophomore or redshirt freshman? He has two uh, years from what I... Yeah, red, redshirt sophomore, but doesn't have two years. He has more than that because right. of the the bonus year. So. But, but my, my point is, like, I guess if you look at everything on a three-year clock and his ability to... as a, He's starting, so he's not going to likely transfer. But yep. as a player, and if you're being optimistic about his skills you look at it in a three-year window because he could go to the NFL. What happens in two years? I don't know. Like, you could have two guys that you recruit on the roster and both of them transfer. The answer right. to the question right now immediately is Landon Tangwall. That's what's behind Olaf Ashanu. Drew Shelton was recruited this class, class of 2022, just got on campus. He's going to be the backup, uh, you know, the, the next guy in line. But then in the class of 2023, you've got a bunch of guys, including I think Javen Williams can be a left tackle. But then there's a bunch of guys out there that are uncommitted that Penn State is pursuing that I think they need to land a left tackle prospect, not just a tackle prospect. Uh, but yeah, that's what that's the that's the outlook right now. But none of that really matters in two years because it's all going to be different. Yeah, and, and I, I will say. Um... You know, Rashid, Rashid Walker left early for the NFL. Connor McGovern left early for the NFL. 
Um, can you think of any others from Penn State recently? Like, it, it just it no. feels to me. I could be wrong about this, but it feels to me like, especially on the offensive line, it's almost. It, I'm not going to say that it's completely reverse of the get the clock started, yeah. but they like that time to like offensive linemen like that time to be able to, to marinate a little bit. Right. Like, right. If you give, I'm not saying everybody's going to use it, but having five years at your disposal is not something that people object to on the offensive line in particular. Right. Like right. They like right. having that option later in their careers. So I'm I doing mean, the unreasonable to... thing of projecting yeah. what I think about the skill level of these players is that, Fashanu has the opportunity to do that. I mean, I wrote yeah. about him uh, last week yeah. or the week before as a guy that has possible first-round potential because of how long he is, how quick his feet are. Now, all of those things could be exposed, and he might not be as quick. He might not be as strong, He might, you know, as we saw in the spring game. But they might not. So, like, we're, we're kind of trying to set the floor of where he is and what he could be. And I'm always optimistic about a guy's potential when I see the things I like and, and, and then they have to prove to me that it's not the case, you know, through the evidence of play. Yep. So anyway, let's move yep. on to another question. <laughs> Z- Zach four. I think this is his first question. So welcome to the mailbag show, Zach. Will the noon kick, assuming Penn State chooses Ohio State, affect what the whiteout recruits? The glamour of the whiteout has always been 107,000 fans, night sky, sea of white. Kind of hard to make that spectacle in the middle of the day, especially in the fall where everything is very muted. Middle of the day, mm-hmm. not, as, uh, not as flashy. Uh, we had another question about this. Would you consider two whiteouts or using the stripe out as a whiteout? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I would be, su- put it this way. I will be somewhat surprised if Penn state doesn't find an opportunity for a night game on the schedule in September or the beginning of October. Right. So, right. Uh, I don't have, hang on one second. I don't have the schedule right in front of me. Um, but Minnesota is, uh, October 22, Northwestern is October one central Michigan. That is the one that I would peg, right? Like, and it, I know that it seems counterintuitive, but Penn state has not Penn state. The big 10 network has gone to that playbook before. Right. So interesting. Uh, right. So, uh, Buffalo was a night game for Penn state. Like, oh yeah. Putting Penn state against central Michigan on the big 10 network. Correct. In prime time. Correct. So look, I don't, who's, who's, I don't know that that is the, Sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, schools have no choice over this anymore. <laughs> that, that's the thing that is uh, not discussed is th- these are in these decisions, Penn, like Penn State, other schools, they might lobby for certain times, but it is not within their control, right? right. The networks get picks. The networks get to dictate the times that these games are played at. Uh, I, I, bottom line, Ohio State is not going to be a night game. Yep. Not happening. It's going to be on Fox. Fox is going to put it, it's World Series game. Uh, well, first of all, it doesn't even matter when the World Ser- Series game is, even if it's in the afternoon. Though There's not going to be a, a noon World Series game, okay? And right. they're not going to split up what they do on Fox, which is the 11 a.m. pregame show. So the yep. 11 a.m. runs into a noon kick. The noon kick is the national marquee game. Yep. Guess what? It's going to be Ohio State. So Ohio State is going to be a whiteout, I think. Uh, I will be surprised if it's not, uh, but there will be other opportunities. There, there has to be a night game. I, yeah. I, it just would surprise me beyond belief if either Ohio week two against uh, right September ten, yeah, or Central Michigan or Northwestern. Those are the three that make the most sense to me to be night games. Yeah. I, so I thought you were going to say put the whiteout on Big Ten Network, and, and Penn State does control when they do the whiteout, at the very least. And they're not going to yeah. do the whiteout on, on Big Ten Network. They're going to do that on a national affiliate where everyone sees it. As yep. far as the recruits, I, I don't know that that makes a difference because it's, I mean, it's it's the whole... Like, there is some difference, but I don't think it would make such a difference as long as the, as the crowd is still into it, right? So the yeah. real magic is that the crowd 
is into it more than any other game. They become a part of the show and they know it. And do you feel the same way or do you feel silly like seeing Batman in broad daylight? Look. It's my least uh, favorite part of the third Batman movie, which was my least favorite movie. The third? Anyway. Uh, yeah, okay. I got you. I'm, I'm with you. Okay. You know, at the end where he's standing out yeah, there yeah. and he's like on the yeah. court steps and he's punching people. Nice, I'm like, yeah. this feels really silly. Like, for the first time ever, me, a grown man watching another grown man pretend to be a bat and beating people up in the dark felt normal. But then when you see it in broad daylight, you're like, oh, what am I doing? What is yeah. he doing? What are we all doing here? Yeah, this, and has so, to, this has to happen after dark, right? Right. Um, Is that how you feel about the whiteout, or do you feel kind of silly? Does it take some of the juice out for you as one of the 107 to 9 to 10,000? So it's better. It's better. Look, even if the game starts during the day and finishes at night, like that, that has been so, like Penn State did that for Notre Dame in what was that, 2007? I want to say like games that have started. It doesn't really matter, right? Like the 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 things for me that matter are whiteout has to happen against the best opponent on your home slate. Yeah, that's it. And so that there are no other options there in terms of a whiteout. Uh, but then the downside is, yes. You can still have that atmosphere. You want all of your recruits to be there. You you want to. It's still going to be jacked up. Like yeah. Wisconsin this past year was an 11 a.m. kick because it was a big noon game. Yeah. Right. So so the damage that it does is to recruiting. Like that's the like not not because of the spectacle because you can't get people to state college at eight in the morning. It's, right. It's very very difficult to be able to arrange for that in terms of unofficial visitors. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's just a much better circumstance to be able to lead into a 7 PM game where these guys have the opportunity as high school recruits, right. And their families yeah. to be able to take in all of that for an entire day. Yeah. And my guess is Penn state will still find a way. One of the networks will still find a way to put a game at night and Penn state will use that game to, showcase what the game day atmosphere is yeah. like. I, I think that if you had back-to-back -back weeks, Minnesota, you can build a very compelling story. Isn't Kirk Shiraka back there as the offense coordinator? I think he's he back. Is. Yeah, you've he got is. so you've got Kirk Shiraka who, uh, you know, left and came back against his team that he left for. You've yep. got Minnesota who ended Penn State's dream originally, of being in the college football playoff in 2019, ostensibly yep. assuming the loss to Ohio State later, right? But, you know, that that particular game, I could build a narrative that that is a great night game. You don't get to see it very often. These are two yep. teams with some storylines. I think if you have back-to-back -back big games like that, and the first one's at night, especially if Penn State wins, and if they're, in, you know... You got to get through Michigan, so that's <laughs> that's another meat grinder of three games. But that would be uh, that would set up for a very big game then against Ohio State. Uh, let's see, did we do this one already? Okay, so Psychim asks, enjoyed your comparison of 2019 and 2021 teams, which is why I thought of Minnesota that way. I've been doing that this week on the BWI Daily Edition. Stay tuned tomorrow where we take a look at the defense to see how Penn State can build back a contender. What do they need from the last time that they were good? with Sean Clifford as their quarterback. So anyway, the key to going forward, obviously besides better offensive line, is a running back who scares the team because of speed and ability to break tackles. None of that last year. Journey Brown and then Kane on the third place set us back in 2020, losing both of those players in 2020. The whole defense is different if you do not have a great running back. Um, he believes that the two freshman running backs can make this happen. So Nate... Yeah. This one is kind of just like, I'm going to set you up and then just, you know, hit, this is the home run derby for you. So do you agree with Sykem? Yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, well, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe. But my, my the problem that I have is what's to say that 
Kevon Lee can't necessarily do that. Right, like what? What is preventing him from no, throwing someone to the ground? Not the to way be mean, Journey Brown did his forty time. Like no, not, what's I, preventing I him is his forty time. But but scaring people in terms of running hard. Look, like so. This is he, I, what I he's referencing. This. What he's referencing is that yesterday on the show, I talked about the fact that Penn State last year and the year before did not have any sort of threat in the backfield that scared defensive coordinators enough to change the way they called the game. Sure. Teams did not. Teams went coverage. I mean, look at what happened with Auburn. They played four deep the entire game because Penn State was not a threat on the ground. So when you have that, you're throwing into exponentially harder coverages. And when you do that, you put everything on the quarterback, and then the quarterback has to make a thousand different throws, a thousand yep. different uh, decisions, because there's no threat to turn defensive coordinators back into what they are, which is conservative player that that live in the fear of giving up rushing yards. So if you can stop it with six, like we talked about earlier, you'll do that so you can take everything away. Penn State yep. needs a running back, a threat to to shock defensive coordinators out of that with the Penn State offense. Yeah, and and are there signs that Nick Singleton and Catron Allen can be that? Absolutely. Yes. Like hundred uh, percent. I, I just think that you you, you want to be able to have both to a certain extent, right? Like even right. Noah Kane, when he was good and playing at his best in 2019, was a powerful runner yeah right like yep. uh, i mean you want like if if i'm if i'm saying that nick singleton is that guy uh the the let me backtrack just a second what's the iconic journey brown carry before he wasn't able to play football anymore like what what is the iconic carry for him I, I always think about the one in Minnesota where he, I think it was a 70 something or 80 yard run for a touchdown where he just okay. blew right by everybody. But what was there one from well, the Outback Bowl you're, or the Cotton Bowl you're thinking of? The Cotton Bowl is the one that I'm thinking of, which is look, like most of the time, and maybe I'm wrong about this, correct me if I am, but most of the time you're not going to be able to run away from everybody, right? Like, the, yeah, that happens. There, you do go 80 or whatever. But more often than not, you're going to have to take some contact on the way to get there. Yeah. And so to me, that that power element of, yeah, you, 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 the, the speed is what was missing last year. No question about it. But there was also a missing element of just, hey, like, you guys can't go down the first time that somebody touches you. Oh, for right? sure. Like that, for sure. That, was, that yeah. was one of the major talking points of the spring was simply, look, uh, you guys go down too easy. So you got to be able to break a tackle. You got to yeah. be able to make somebody miss. And Penn State just hasn't had any of that last season. But yeah, you uh, to me, it would seem pretty apparent that that possibility now exists on the roster where it didn't last season. Yeah. And and you're right. The, so power speed without power is is a receiver. Like that's not that's not what you're looking for at the running back position. Uh, I don't remember the, I, I remember the one you're talking about now. I think he broke like three tackles and put one poor dude's face into the dirt with his poor hand. guy. Yeah. Uh, but I, one tackle was broken early and the other two were broken like 20 yards downfield after he had exploded into open space. Right. That element, that threat of, if you let this guy loose, he could be gone. Yep. And therefore we need to dedicate numbers to make sure he's not. That's what Penn State hasn't had in a while. Uh, and that's, I guess, the the thought of of the the explosive element because you're not worried about a guy that can break a tackle and you'll get him after ten yards. You don't want that. But what right. you don't want is guy in the hole breaks a tackle and goes sixty. That's yep. the last thing you want, or yep. at least gets to the safety and then you have another opportunity for him to break another tackle. Uh, got to get through. We always do this where we have to get through all, like five of these at once. Um, have we made the transfer portal too much of a thing? Like, are people too afraid of it now? Because PSU Ram asks, when is the next wave of transfers in and out expected? May 1st deadline of sorts. They don't know if that really would restrict players from leaving a program from or accepting going to a new one. Are things pretty stable until fall camp? 
Or should we expect a few losses and possibly also a few uh, targets joining the team before fall camp? Uh, you know what? I, I don't actually know. A, like, I know that if you intended to transfer um, and play this season, it had to be before um, before May 1, but I don't. I don't know exactly what the details are on that. Like, yeah. I think, uh, you know, is there, is there wiggle room for, um, is there wiggle room for graduate transfers, right? Like how does, yeah. how does, because it's not, it's not exactly the same process. Can you file um, for a waiver as well? So that's another thing that players were doing before was filing right. for a waiver an exemption from the rule. Right. So, uh, you know, if we look back, last year um uh did, did penn state bring um aj litton to, to penn state after may one i think he did i think they did right uh that's a great question i i want to say i want to say 100%. i think it was yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah because it was in the summer i do remember yeah. it was in the summer so uh there was a couple of there's a couple of back really... in the summer yeah, right, T, like TJ Finley, the guy that went to uh, that went to Auburn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I guess anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Blue Hornet twenty two asks, "How awesome will it be to have four players from McDonough on the field at the same time? Are we still looking like the top option for Mason Robinson?" I will just say that I do my best to answer every question here on the show, but if it is a recruiting recruiting question, that one is best left to Ryan Snyder, our recruiting insider. I and I'll just follow up by saying. He put in a pick for Mason Robinson to end up at Penn State. Uh, and to answer the first part of that, like I don't necessarily have a, a dog in that hunt as far as having as many McDonough football players on the Penn State roster as possible. I will say that every single time I talk to one of them or watch their film, the defensive linemen from, from uh, McDonough in particular have impressed me. Their defensive line coach, Dan Yarborough, I forgot about him the last time I was talking, forgot his name. He does a great job with those kids. Because uh, Mason Robinson, Deny Dennis Sutton, like they have great fundamentals at the position. They use their hands exceptionally well, which is why I think, you know, when it comes to Mason Robinson, his fit at Penn State, I think he could be a good one in this class with a lot of very talented players that are uh, in the 2023 cycle at his position. Uh, move on to this one. Can you pre can you generate pressure without having to force? a blitz and can T Frank out squat Javen, meaning Javen Williams, Nate, can you press, can you generate pressure without blitzing? Yes. If you yes. have the right players, that's exactly that's right. All, that's always the goal, right? The goal is to be able to rush for and get to the quarterback Yep. or get into the backfield. I mean, that's, uh, they talk about that all the time. So yes, it can be in, and when you have certain players who do that well, Right. Like they it, basically, and you're going to be much more uh, uh, in intelligible about this, but y the numbers hurt you if the more that you use to create pressure, if you have to consistently send yeah. five and six, there's diminishing uh, returns. Yeah. Correct. And well, and, and you're leaving yourself more vulnerable yeah. uh, in the back end. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that's always the goal. I, I do um, love the idea of the, the like looking at some of the coverages and and you know from the spring game and it's like yeah, Manny Diaz runs a lot of zone coverages. And it's like they're not zone coverages if everyone's in single coverage because you've blitzed everyone. Right. Right. <laughs> like, sure, they're uh, all in a zone, but there's only six of them, and there are five players in the pattern so what are you what are right. you saying there like yeah right. it's it's a zone maybe <laughs> but you yes. have very creative ways of of framing uh these things but no i yeah i i, th I think that yes uh the the comment from manny diaz that struck me uh this past spring was the best Pass coverage is effective pass rush. Yeah, yeah. I when when he said that, uh, he's it, the the quote was, "If you want to know what coverage I believe in, I believe in pressure." 
and he is willing to do just about anything to get it. Uh, yep. Something that I've been meaning to do is go back and look at kind of his differences. But th the problem is his defense radically changed from like 2016, 17 to what it was this final season where he rent all in on, on this dime defense on having three safeties on the field, having a full time, that striker position is a, uh, is a, uh, is a safety. Now he's done it throughout his career, but it really skewed towards coverage players last couple of years. And that changed the percentage of the time he blitzed, where it was getting up close to 50% of the time he was blitzing. That's a little aggressive. But with a good defense and a good defensive line, it was much more in line with what Brent Pry did, which is aggressive. So it's not, maybe it's like a third of the time. You know, if you go through and you look at individual games and look at the numbers in PFF, blitzing a quarterback 30% one game and 55% another and just kind of eyeballing all those numbers, they were dramatically different last season than they were uh, a couple seasons ago. So that's why, to me, Damian Robinson and Denai Dennis Sutton are so important in this class because to get the full effect to get the best version of your defense, surprise, you want to be the best you can be at every position. Uh, and to answer the second part, no, I cannot out-squat a 290-pound individual who is an athletic phenomenon. No. I, I try real hard for a small dude, but I'm strong for a regular guy, not strong for that. Travis Peters asks, why, speaking of giant people, why has Penn State had such a problem recruiting and or developing difference makers at defensive tackle? Good players, but no game changers. Nate, lots of recruiting questions, so I'm going to throw this one to you. What is the holdup here? I don't know. I, it, hold, the holdup for getting game-changing defense. I, I think that I would make some – I think I would make an argument uh, against what he's arguing, right? Jor Jordan Hill, yes, was an excellent defensive tackle. Uh, Kevin Givens was a really good defensive tackle. Yeah. He's not a nose, but – uh, played the position well. Austin Johnson has had a lengthy career in the yep. NFL at defensive tackle. Um, there are others. I don't know. I, at least to me, I, I think that there, there, and you would think that PJ Mustafer was that or on his way to becoming that. Yeah. Um, you know, is, is Beeman this year, you know, uh, is that his trajectory? I, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't think that it, I don't think, first of all, I think series different maker that in itself is kind of problematic at the position because the, the biggest difference that the interior of the defensive line makes is often to the benefit of others. Right. Yeah. You um, know, so th there's not stat hogs. The, so they can be. If you've, and this is, I think, so uh, to answer this question, to give an answer, what what I think has been an issue is that there are rare athletes, and this is kind of the obvious, the obvious answer is there are rare athletes that are great offensive tackles and three techniques, and they're they're rare, so they go other places, and Penn State has not been able to land a lot of those guys. Their second uh, course of action is then take a defensive end in high school who is obviously a defensive tackle body type. Move them inside, bulk them up, and have them play at three technique and hope you can get a serious pass rushing threat from that guy on the interior. I agree with that process. I think that's an obvious you're looking for. You're looking for inefficiencies. You're looking for guys that are uh, have untapped potential. The problem is, it goes back to the original thing. If they were rare athletes, they were rare athletes. So, uh, you know, guys have not developed that way over time where you take that three technique and he's 295 pounds and he's stronger than everybody else and he's winning individual matchups and he's getting six sacks. You know, because a lot of this is, is pushing the pocket from the interior as well or getting tackles for loss. So it's just about, you know... It's not just about developing the guys that are there. It's about finding the right ingredients to begin with. And the right ingredients, in the end, are just rare. So you get lucky on a guy like Zane Durant, it seems. You get lucky on a guy like Hakeem Beeman, who can play severely undersized for the position. I mean, like, 30 pounds from what I would be comfortable with. But in the modern college football, 
you can play with that. And we'll see if it works. And we'll see if these guys hold up, run, and pass. Uh, last question here today. Beaverman72 says, Theo Johnson is the X factor, aside from Sean Clifford, that can change the offense from average to great. Why am I wrong? Why is he wrong, Nate? Hmm. Is he wrong? He might not be wrong. <laughs> I mean, a good, a good tight end can very much change what Penn State does. Uh, James Franklin called it the secret sauce last year. I th nope. I think he's right. I think it's yeah. Theo Johnson. Uh, I, a running back would immeasurably help. If it's Nick Singleton, Katron Allen, and Theo Johnson, that all hit. And Mitchell Tinsley, even better. <laughs> yeah. The Guys, only... Go for it. Well, no, nah, I just, like, the more you have, the better. If yeah. Theo Johnson is on an island and there are no receivers and there are no running backs, it doesn't matter how good Theo Johnson is. It doesn't matter how good Brenton Strange is. It doesn't matter how any of those guys are. Yeah. Tight ends are complementary pieces to me yep. in con in conjunction to everything else being in the right place. Yep. Um, I just, I can't. I can't separate them that way. So that was going to be, I, I agree as well. I was looking for places that Penn State was inefficient last year and looking for areas where they can get more out of things. And and really, I was looking at them in the slot and, and their lack of production from the slot. But they were out there as blockers for a lot of those plays where on those bubble screens and those basically handoffs on the flat where you've got three players out there blocking two of them are tight ends and you throw to a receiver you motion in the formation you're trying to create a new offensive line out in space so they were doing a lot of that dirty work out in space but really the answer is a more efficient throw and the most efficient way you can move the football down the field is chunk plays and those typically go to receivers so the only reason you're wrong is that uh, Keandre Lambert Smith is soaking up all those targets or Parker Washington turns into a seam threat down the middle of the field. He is just an unstoppable force down the middle of the field as the slot receiver. Or all three of them work out, and then the tight end is an afterthought. So the only time that your tight end should be your number one receiver is if they're George Kittle, if they're Travis Kelsey. Otherwise, throw it to more valuable positions. Don't throw well, it to your running backs. Pat, Pat Fryermuth was the top option at the beginning of the 2020 season. And it when was not John efficient. Dotson Right when Jahan yeah. Dotson wasn't Jahan Dotson, yep, uh, he was beginning to become right. In any yep. case, when Pat Fryermuth was catching seven passes a game the first two or three games before obviously he got hurt, Penn State's offense wasn't very good. Yep, yep. So Theo Johnson can be more than that because he's faster. He's uh, a little maybe the same size, but like with different dimensions, he's, you know, I really love Pat Fryermuth's game, but he was always that sort of complimentary piece to yep. the KJ Hamler, to the, to the, to the offense. He's yep. supposed to provide a vital role that makes the offense unstoppable as another, like, Oh God, another option. And it's a six foot six tight end that also Correct. is quick and can turn and runs really good routes. Like Theo Johnson can provide that he can provide the deep seam, but they just need those elements is what they need. Put puts you over the top. Yes, man. I'm having a rough show today. Go back. <laughs> no, do, do the, do the outro. No, we're doing I'm it now. Done. We're doing it live. I just hit the wrong. I hit the wrong music. Uh, Chris on our BWI message board would be furious if he didn't get to hear the outro music because it used to be the intro music. So I got to make sure Chris is happy. That'll do it today for the BWI mailbag show. Thanks to everybody who put in uh, their questions. We'll be back next week with the same thing. So get your brain moving. Think of some more thoughts that we can talk about next week. Coming up tomorrow, the last BWI daily as we head into the weekend. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. We'll talk to you then.